Moldova is a country of roughly four million people. Uh, it's situated uh, totally inland. It's surrounded uh, on both sides by Ukraine and Romania. Uh, it doesn't have an outlet onto the Black Sea, but it does have the river Dniester or Dniestru runs through it, uh, and the Prut is on its border with Romania. Uh, it's a very small country. Uh, it was at one time the densest part of the Soviet Union in terms of population. Uh, there was a lot of industry there, a lot of heavy agriculture. Uh, that still tends to be the case. It's a very productive country. Um, it's a major agricultural exporter, uh, and it has a very productive labor force. And Mo Moldovan labor is actually spread throughout Europe, uh, and it's viewed very positively. Uh, Moldova has a lot of problems, though. This is a country that, in a sense, is trapped between east and west. Uh, one of the biggest challenges for Moldova is where is it headed in the long term. Right now it's governed by a coalition for European integration, which suggests that it's headed westward, uh, but that coalition is not as powerful or, or effective in governance terms as it could be. So ultimately the strategic significance of this country, I think, is less about Moldova itself and more about the precedent that such a small country with such unique problems and challenges might be able to set uh, for what remains of the post-communist challenge in Europe. Moldova is a small country that's very interested in engagement with the West, particularly with the United States, but also with the Europeans. Um, it's a country that is a member of the Confederation of Independent States, which means it's a post-Soviet country, a, a former Republic of the Soviet Union. And yet at the same time, it's the kind of country with which the West can establish a really deep and meaningful relationship. It doesn't have quite the same level of pushback that you would find in Ukraine, in Central Asia, obviously in Russia itself. That's not to say that Moldova is all about Russia versus the West. It's a country with all kinds of great potential in its own right, but it is definitely a precedent-setting possibility in terms of how you balance the interests of Russia in the West within the former Soviet Union itself, within the CIS. So that's Moldova's real strategic role in terms of engagement with the United States and with the West. Moldova is generally viewed as a post-Soviet success story. It's had three peaceful turnovers of power uh, since the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, that puts it at the very top of the list of post-Soviet CIS countries. Um, in 2009, of course, there were uh, street protests ac accompanying the turnover between the communists and the current ruling coalition. Um, but that's really because Moldova is still a divided country. Even though it has democracy, it's very politically divided. Moldova's parliament has 101 seats, and it requires 52 votes in order to select a president, uh, in order to, to muster a majority, essentially. Uh, no individual party has been able to do that, even though the communists have come close with 48 seats. So the challenge with the November elections will be whether the communists can get over the hurdle of getting 52 votes, or whether the coalition that is currently held together for about 18 months between the other four parties, um, which is called the Alliance for European Integration, is going to be able to muster that same level of majority support, but then further actually be able to select a president. And they weren't able to do that for the last two years, so it's doubtful that they'll be able to do that this time around. At stake in the November 21st election is not only the uh, success or failure of the Communist Party to return to power uh, after being out of power for almost two years now, uh, but also the survival of this very fragile, very weak coalition among basically modernizing European-oriented forces. Um, this group is very divided, not only because of the personal ambitions of its various leaders, uh, but it's also divided because of the Russian-oriented population within Moldova, the Romanian-slash-European-oriented population, and other minority populations, uh, many of whom are often provoked to vote along ethnic or linguistic lines. Uh, so any of those things could break apart this coalition, and I would be very surprised if we saw another similarly powerful, in other words, more than 50 percent of the seats in Parliament, coalition emerging that was equally supportive of European integration, that was equally progressive in terms of its approach both to Russia and to the Transnistria conflict. I mean, this was a unique moment in history, and yet, unfortunately, it also seems like a wasted opportunity. In 1992, when Moldova became independent from the Soviet Union, when the Soviet Union came apart, 
um, the Transnistrian region along the eastern bank of the Dniester River, which runs into the Black Sea, so this is sandwiched between Moldova itself uh, and Ukraine, uh, broke away forcibly from Moldova. Um, there was bloody fighting. Uh, thousands of people were killed. Uh, and there was a lot of, of use of heavy Soviet military equipment, which had been withdrawn from Central and Eastern Europe, from places like East Germany and Poland during the late 1980s, and dumped in Transnistria because it was the headquarters of the Soviet 14th Army. So they had the means to kill each other, and they did it very well. Um, and it was, in fact, Russian intervention which ultimately stopped the fighting, but it also froze in place the status of Transnistria as being an independent region on the eastern bank of the river. This conflict is among the so-called frozen conflicts of the post-Soviet space, is certainly the least uh, explosive at this time. There hasn't been any shooting or killing along the line of control uh, since the conflict ended in 1992. Uh, that's in part because there's a force of 1,000-plus Russian peacekeepers there uh, who are protecting uh, or controlling the border, controlling crossings on the border, uh, as well as uh, allegedly looking after the weapons depots, which remain in Transnistria since Soviet times. It's one of the major concerns there. Um, but on that note, uh, there are some real issues related to the Transnistria conflict. Uh, I would say, first of all, it is the issue of smuggling of weapons, um, possible smuggling of people, drugs, uh, even nuclear material. Uh, smugglers were recently apprehended just a couple of weeks ago uh, in Moldova with uh, uranium. Uh, unclear where they were headed with that, but the existence of this unsettled border dispute on the border between Ukraine and Moldova is, is of great significance in terms of security in that region, the Black Sea region overall. I see the second uh, important strategic point about the Transnistria conflict is it's a point of opportunity. Uh, unlike the conflict between Russia and Georgia, uh, which resulted in a hot war just two years ago uh, and is now essentially frozen in favor of the separatist Georgian regions, uh, there's a possibility to resolve the Transnistria-Moldova conflict in a way that benefits all the parties. Um, right now, both sides are suffering from the inability to export their goods in a direct and logical way to European and Russian markets. Um, they each suffer a sort of different half of that problem. Um, fixing that through some sort of association between those two countries that would accommodate their needs, that could be endorsed by the Ukrainians, by the Russians, by the Europeans, and ultimately by the United States and the United Nations and the OSCE as well, is going to be in everyone's benefit. It's going to make both sides more prosperous. The Russians actually seem to be moving in the direction of supporting that, rather than supporting yet another decade. This would be a third decade of frozen status for this conflict. The Russians are actually willing to back some sort of movement towards a negotiated settlement. But of course, they put the onus on the two parties themselves to push for the negotiations. They're saying they're not going to hand a solution to the Moldovans and the Transnistrians, but they will support whatever kind of negotiated settlement might come out. So I think the onus then is on the West, including the United States, which acts as an observer uh, to the, the so-called 5 plus 2 negotiations on the conflict, to try and be creative and come up with solutions that the Russians and the Ukrainians might be interested in. Moldova's economy, just like the country overall, is very small. Uh, it's worth about $10 billion, um, which puts it roughly on a par with the West Bank or Rwanda. So that gives you an idea of this country that is really in the European heartland is a very poor country. Um, by the same token, it represents a pretty significant economic opportunity. Uh, investment is inexpensive. It has very productive agricultural land. It makes up about 40 percent of its GDP. Um, it has some heavy industry, which is a holdover from the Soviet period. Uh, there are also opportunities, though, obviously, to build new power uh, and other infrastructure there. Um, and it has a very, very attractive labor force. It tends to be a well-educated labor force. It's very mobile. Um, a great number of, of Moldovan citizens have experience already working in the West, uh, legally or illegally. Um, but generally speaking, Moldovan labor is very well respected in Europe. It's not viewed in the same way as some of the other uh, Eastern European countries who are seen as sort of a threat. Um, they're, they're small numbers of Moldovans, uh, and they work very hard. So there's a real economic opportunity there. The problem that Moldova has today, of course, is it doesn't have a uh, free trade agreement or a visa-free travel agreement with the European Union. So it has a lot of trouble exporting its labor and exporting its goods to Europe. Uh, by the same token, uh, it's run into a lot of trade troubles with Russia, which is still its biggest trading partner. So for example, wine, uh, 
uh, which is by far Moldova's biggest export and is actually famous throughout the former Soviet, Soviet region for its uh, champagne-style sparkling wines and red wines and sweet wines. Um, they have not been able to export their wine to Russia recently because there's been a de facto health ban in place in which the Russian health officials have questioned the, uh, the safety of Moldovan wine and effectively, without, without officially banning the wine, are not letting it leave warehouses on the border. So, of course, Moldovan wine producers uh, don't want to send their wine to get stuck there. Moldova's relationship with Russia, even though Russia is and has been Moldova's strongest trade partner and traditionally a very strong relationship under the communists, uh, Chisinau and Moscow had reasonably close relations. Voronin was viewed as a strong leader, just like Putin, and so the two got along beautifully, reasonably well. Um, they've really suffered of late, though. Uh, there's been the dispute over wine, uh, which has left a major Moldovan uh, export industry essentially frozen, unable to export wine uh, effectively to Russia. Uh, Russia has also allegedly been uh, interfering in Moldova's electoral politics, uh, backing some candidates, paying for advertisements, um, seeking to intimidate other candidates. Um, so it's not clear exactly what Russia's role will be there, whether they're trying to simply hedge their bets. Um, some of the parties are clearly more favorable to Russia, others aren't, but Russia seems to be backing multiple different horses uh, in a hope to have some influence or control uh, with whoever wins. Uh, also in Transnistria, Russia has for a long time now been issuing passports to former Soviet citizens living in that region. It's in the interest of those citizens because then they receive Russian pensions. Um, it's in Russia's interest because then Russia has a plausible basis to assert some sort of interest in the region. And this, we recall, was a major problem in the Caucasus, uh, where Russia was giving passports to citizens of South Ossetia and Abkhazia and claiming to be acting in defense of its citizens. So this passportization policy really seems to be a pretext for Russia's engagement uh, in Transnistria. But then again, it doesn't really need much more of a pretext than the fact that it has a thousand plus uh, peacekeepers and security forces in Transnistria uh, protecting the borders, uh, maintaining uh, the peace essentially between Moldova and Transnistria, but also protecting uh, a major uh, ammunition and weapons dump at Kobasna uh, in the northern part of Transnistria, which represents uh, a great number of uh, former Soviet weapons that have been withdrawn from Central and Eastern Europe. So Russia is deeply interwoven and engaged with this part of the world, and the argument is made that it will be reluctant in the sort of age of resurgent Russian imperialism to withdraw the foothold that it has um, pretty far into Europe and also on the western side of Ukraine, so that in effect Russia has a presence on Ukraine's west, on Ukraine's east, and with the extension of the Sevastopol Basic Agreement in Crimea on Ukraine's south as well. And depending on how good Russian-Belarusian relations are, it may have a presence on Ukraine's north. So in terms of keeping Ukraine under wraps also, uh, Russia has strong incentives to remain in Moldova. This is really the challenge. Moldova's current ruling coalition, of course, is called the Alliance for European Integration. Um, it's aptly named in the sense that that does represent the will of the majority of the Moldovan people to at least um, draw closer to Europe, to trade with Europe, to travel in Europe. Uh, literally hundreds of thousands of Moldovans are living and working or have lived and worked in Western Europe. They come back to Moldova bringing back money, bringing back education and insight, oftentimes children whom they've had abroad. Uh, sometimes with foreign spouses. So you have a real uh, de facto integration going on with Europe. And yet, ironically, all of this is happening without any uh, de jure integration. You don't have a, an EU association agreement yet between Moldova and the EU. You do not have a visa-free travel regime. You don't have a free trade regime. All of these things are major blockages for Moldova, not only in terms of uh, being able to sell its products and send its people legally to Europe, uh, but also in terms of becoming more appealing itself, uh, which would help it to resolve the Transnistria conflict. If Transnistria citizens could look across the river at Moldova and say, wow, this is a country that's engaged with the West, that's very prosperous, that's very appealing, uh, then they'd have much greater incentives, I think, to break away from the Russian uh, stranglehold that they're in now and find some sort of solution in which they lived in harmony with their neighbors.